Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. Uh, we are now on the 10th and the last lecture of uh, this course on international relations. And I hope that uh, on this journey that we have made, we have covered uh, several uh, areas and terrains which have allowed us to look at uh, IR in multiple ways. So in our first lecture, we looked at trying to define what the international is. Uh, we looked at the setting up of the first uh, academic uh, departments in IR in uh, Wales and the London School of Economics at the end of the First World War. Uh, we have been through uh, five theories and each one of them is rich and uh, uh, filled with a certain perspective about how to examine uh, the international. It also draws attention to our own location and that is what uh, the theories of feminism, uh, Marxism and critical theory do. Uh, liberalism and realism uh, allow us to see things from the dominant point of view which is uh, the present economic hegemon that is uh, the USA. And uh, this journey has been extremely rich in uh, especially in the last two lectures. Uh, where we have looked at international organizations and uh, we have looked at globalization. So these last three lectures are uh, married to each other in, the, in its design because um, they, each of these feed into each other uh, from 1919 um, till 2019 uh, IOs have multiplied. Uh, they, ha they exist at almost every realm, whether it's the environment, uh, nuclear weapons, um, uh, submarine uh, ecosystems, uh, the climate. And uh, what we can see is that there is now a new sense of what is global governance. A hundred years ago, the only actor on the international platform was uh, the nation, the state. A uh, hundred years later, uh, there is a new form of sovereignty and this new form of sovereignty works around uh, regulatory agreements on trade, uh, on finance, uh, on markets, on goods, on technology and uh, Shais and Shais in their book, the new sovereignty argue that this new form of sovereignty is one where the state engages, uh, negotiates and uh, tiptoes around uh, regulatory uh, frameworks. So when we looked at international organizations, we saw that IOs, uh, there are a few IOs which also uh, are greater than the member states themselves. The two examples being the International Cri Criminal Tribunal and then you have the dispute settlement body of the WTO and both of these operate at the structural level. That means they uh, can push, uh, can order states to do things with, without uh, and states have to comply to their orders. So there is a new sense of compliance and compliance means uh, adhering to uh, norms and rules which have been set down and in effect if there is one creature which has made a long journey from the time it evolved in the 16th century to now is that of and uh, the state essentially uh, is uh, a site of so the state is what now uh, draws our attention and in today's lecture I am going to be taking you through to the formation of the state and uh, we are looking at uh, the its new avatar as we see it today 
as a state which is negotiating with multinational corporations, with uh, organi organizations like the World Trade Organization. And fundamentally, the core definition of a state uh, is now being called into question. And we will examine that in its uh, brief history. But before we get to the state, we must first examine what a nation is and that is what we are going to do. So a nation state, uh, the foundations of a state often lie, not always, often lie in a nation and uh, the conceptualization of a nation or a natio which is related to the word nascent or nativity, what you are born into is an indicator of how people have always viewed themselves as us versus them. Uh, communities, tribes, uh, kinships, uh, groups of people have always tended to define themselves as with the commonality against an imagined or a real uh, uh, opposite or somebody else. Uh, so when we look at the emergence of the state system, it is useful to look at uh, a corollary of the nation and uh, the idea that there is something which binds all of us together and which makes us different from other people has been central to uh, the human understanding. For instance, uh, Plato and other Greeks called the Greeks uh, the Hellens and whereas everybody else who did not speak Greek were called Barbaros, and from there is the word uh, barbarian stems from somebody who is uh, not as sophisticated and you also see it in the Hindi word Barbar. So, uh, in a sense, the distinction between us and them ha is fundamental to human definition and one sees it across time, across religion, across epochs and it has fed into uh, the making of the modern state. So when we look into the making of the modern state, we rely upon uh, scholars such as uh, David Held, uh, Anthony Giddens, who provide us with uh, uh, narratives of how the state emerged. Uh, Charles Tilly, for instance, the historian, who is known for the wide breadth that he, uh, the wide span of his works over hundreds of years to see the emergence of an institution. So in our discussion of the nation, we have what we are trying to uh, dwell upon is the idea that communities have traditionally uh, bonded together and identified people who are not like them. And at the same time, we are trying to, uh, trying to find our way to looking into the roots of a state. Uh, where what was the earliest state, uh, what is the definition of a state and how is it that we have come to a point where the principal actors uh, on in, in international politics as well as the domestic sphere is the state. Uh, if people were always banding themselves in groups, uh, it were the empires were far more common through these centuries uh, than states. So empires are by definition large areas of territory uh, controlled by force and domination. But interestingly, uh, empires are often have fuzzy uh, borders and have a multiple uh, uh, multi-ethnic people living within them. So when you look at the Roman Empire, when you look at the Ottoman Empire, when you look at the British Empire, by principle there is a distinction made uh, of the people who belong and the people who don't belong, uh, citizens and subjects and again to return to Plato's uh, people who are Greek and people who are barbaric. 
So empires must be imagined as large uh, contiguous uh, territories controlled by a center, by authority and domination. Uh, outposts were governed by governors, but essentially empires did not have two fundamental features of the state and that is finite and clearly defined borders and a population which is a homogeneous and a classified as a population. Uh, so the earliest uh, mullings and ponderings and theorizing on the state and on the nature of the state is uh, during this period uh, we come to the 16th century. And we see that it is around this time that uh, theoreticians, uh, a mathematician by the name of Thomas Hobbes, a philosopher by the name of John Locke and a writer, uh, a philosopher by the name of Rousseau are mulling over uh, the nature of a state, what is the state. And it is here that notions of a uh, of sovereignty uh, clearly emerge, sovereignty as the absolute power of the head of the state within its boundaries uh, over a finite, over a population with a monopoly of violence and resources is the image which emerges at this time and of course it is being accompanied by uh, historical uh, changes. So within Europe between 1618 and 1648 is the uh, 30 years war which ends with the uh, Treaty of Westphalia and within uh, Western academia uh, Westphalia ha ha has been upheld as the triumph of uh, not the triumph but as the completion of the modern state. Uh, as a state with clearly defined boundaries, uh, a population and a monopoly over violence and that is the birth of the absolute state. Uh, but again, it is the, fe the features that we are looking at are sovereignty and the definition of sovereignty would be the complete uh, power within that space of the head of the state, usually a monarch. And with Westphalia comes this idea that within a certain uh, area there is a identifiable uh, source of power and that is the head of the state. Uh, we see that there is a corollary of this thinking within the theories and uh, philosophical writings of the social contractualists. And therefore, it is here that there emerges a strong petition, a strong argument for the individual. So even though Westphalia marks the coming of the absolute state, it is also at this time that there is a fervent recognition of the need of uh, to protect the rights of the individual and it is here that Hobbes is truly striking. Uh, Hobbes is a remarkable figure uh, who conducted scientific experiments, who was a mathematician, but who also uh, wrote a foremost treatise on uh, politics called the Leviathan. And the Leviathan is a very interesting uh, piece of work. Uh, now, why do we stop at Hobbes? Uh, Hobbes' theory of the state is a foremost recognition of the authority of uh, the state. And uh, let's just pause and look at uh, the term and the word Leviathan itself. The word Leviathan comes from the Bible and uh, it refers to a sea monster and uh, in Hobbes depiction of uh, the state as a monster, as something which is monstrous refers to the fact that the state is so powerful and 
not human that it cannot be expected to be humane uh, but that's not the only aspect of Hobbes which is interesting Hobbes is often seen as an uh, as a champion of uh, liberal rights and it is here that he uses the uh, the ploy of the social contract and the social contract is that uh, agreement that imaginary agreement made between men and the state in uh, admission of the state being uh, created by uh, the contract so the state is a byproduct of the contract and uh, when Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau are referring to the contract of course they are trying to break away from uh, the divine right to rule where the right to rule was seen as a mandate of divinity and uh, in the idea that the state is man-made specifically uh, because there were no women involved in its either its imagination or its execution uh, the state is a artificial being which uh, conducts warfare uh, has a foreign policy runs a good government but ostensibly for the welfare of its citizens uh, so Hobbes uh, theory is uh, contextualized at a time when uh, kings and queens felt that they could rule with impunity and Hobbes intervention is a classic example of how the individual the citizen is uh, shapes the state as much as the state shapes the citizen and there is a balance the citizen has a right to his privacy to her privacy there is a private sphere and there is a public sphere and we see these ideas crystallizing in the economic writings of uh, Adam Smith um, of Ricardo in the political writings of John Stuart Mill uh, Jeremy Bentham and there is this idea that even though the state is powerful uh, it must not uh, strangle or suffocate its citizens and there is a sphere within which the state cannot reach so in effect uh, the 16th century is a fascinating period where one can see as to how certain ideas are crystallizing uh, with the birth of the modern state and clearly identifiable boundaries there is the emergence of uh, also uh, the citizen a person who has a stake to play in the state uh, it is also a period of time when liberalism is flourishing uh, it is a time when the East India Company is set up as the world's first private corporation which it is at part times it is a trading corporation at times it is a mercenary company but this is a period where both the individual and the state their roles are being evaluated assessed and redefined but we do not speak of nationalism yet uh, it is in the 18th century that we see how these two ideas of a nation and a state uh, fuse together in the culmination of two historically uh, two historic nations and that would be uh, the states of Italy and Germany rather Germany and Italy because Germany was formed in 1871 and two decades later would be the state of Italy now what we've been doing so far is that we have looked at nation as an idea of us versus them which has existed in every period in every community uh, of human civilization and we've also seen as to how there emerges a artificial body called the modern state
and we call it the modern state because it is a uh, it is it has broken away it has severed its links from the medieval period of uh, of uh, superstition and being caged in by the church so the modern state is modern precisely because it has a forward looking vision uh, it is it has a monopoly over violence it is sovereign it is not controlled by forces beyond its boundaries such as the church so because we are looking at the 16th 17th and 18th century in such great detail it is of also important to remember that it is during this period that the state defies the holy roman uh, the church the vatican which had been for so many centuries controlling uh, monarchies uh, catholic monarchies uh, from its base in italy uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, points of opposition where states have broken away and redefined themselves and westphalia then becomes a reference point to that uh, so we're looking at three of these states the first is the state of great britain which during the reign of henry the 8th breaks free of um the papal influence that is the influence of the papacy or uh, the pope in the vatican and of course divorce was inconceivable uh within catholicism and when henry the 8th divorces his first wife uh, queen catherine of aragon uh, it creates rumbles because it was unheard of uh, for a king to divorce uh, as uh, his wife and at the risk of being excommunicated henry the 8th uh, breaks away from uh, the papal church and uh, and it is here that Uh, protestantism uh, really flourishes in uh, great britain uh, so that's the first example of states uh, seeking their uh, establishing their sovereignty in every uh, form whether it's henry the 8th and then uh, which goes on by uh, queen elizabeth the 1st who then supports the east india company but we see this coming together of passion and territory in the formation of germany and italy in the 19th century uh so germany's uh, uh genesis the roots of the formation of uh, germany uh, is often credited to her great statesman uh, otto von bismarck he is often seen as a great diplomat and uh before germany was formed it was a collection of several uh districts um within germany prussia being one of them uh and prussia was of course the most uh, powerful and uh, to bismarck goes the credit of rallying uh and initiating a war against france uh with which they would be able to retrieve two priceless spaces called alsace and lorraine which are very rich in iron and when germany defeats uh, france in 1871 at the end of the franco prussian war is when the state of germany emerges from being pulled together with a common language and a common history and with the military engineering of her great uh, minister bismarck the king at this time is king william the 1st and the celebration of germany is seen as one of the high points uh, of nationalism because one sees the clear fusion of territory with a uh, uh, with people with a common history and a common or uh, with a shared memory and these elements go in to making a nation state so what we see over here is that 
states were engineered in the truest sense of the word by lobbying and uh, manufacturing a belief that people have had a shared memory and history and language and it's precisely these elements which go in together in the formation of the state of Italy. So Germany and Italy are often seen as the high points of nationalism, a uh, nationalism which is wedded to territory and uh, it is also here that one sees the role of language and memory in the shaping of a national community. So in a sense, uh, the birth of a nation depends upon a commonality. It could be a language, it could be a memory, it could be a belief in everybody being bound together. But most importantly, it has a sense of a imagined community to use the description by Benedict Anderson about uh, imagination playing a huge role in pulling people together. So what we see are exa four examples of a nation being a group of people with wedded to the idea that they belong and they are marked and different from others. You then have the example of Great Britain which has a mixture, which has a, there is a, there is a heterogeneity to that population with comprising of uh, Scots, Saxons, uh, uh, Irishmen and of Irish people and of course this was again questioned on the basis of uh, nationalism, Scotland and Ireland have argued that they are not part of this artificial construct. And thirdly, you have examples where the nation and territory have fused together in the examples of Germany and Italy. So what you essentially have are several examples of a nation with territory uh, and a nation without territory, a nation with sovereignty and a nation without sovereignty and there are multiple uh, uh, configurations possible of that. A classic example would be the state of Israel, the Zionist uh, pro project which uh, fervently worked towards the formation of Israel in 1948, uh, culminated in 1948 territorially was only possible because there had been a long uh, preserved memory of the Israeli people. So what one sees is that whether it is uh, Kashmir or Palestine, whether it is um, Bosnia or um, the Kurds, uh, there is a sense of an ethnic identity, although not always, which guides people to form a nation. A nation can exist with or without a state and in Italy and Germany, we see the perfect marriage between nationalism and territory. And by the early 20th century, what you then have is the emergence of the modern state system marked by uh, states with clearly defined boundaries as members of this international society. So as Hedley Bull would say that this is an international society with uh, states as uh, members, while at the start of the 20th century many of these states were uh, imperial states, by the center of the century there were newly formed uh, decolonized states which had mimicked and accepted that definition of a state. Now of course this has a very lengthy uh, 
uh, and complicate each decolonization process has been extremely uh, distinct, lengthy. But what one sees is that at the uh, in the middle of the 20th century, one sees that there is a universalization of the modern state with its four elements of a clearly defined boundary, a monopoly over violence, uh, the sovereign state uh, establishing itself as a unquestionable source of power and the sovereign state then becomes the fundamental unit of the international system. The last hundred years therefore have been remarkable in the rapid transformations made from imperialism to decolonization, from colony to state and the easiest way to see this rapid change would be to look at the map in 1919 and to look at the rapid growth in the number of states in these 100 years. This has uh, by far been the most significant change uh, in uh, the manner in which we understand the global by the sheer number of states which have multiplied and uh, each uh, being a sovereign equal member in uh, the eyes of international organizations. So what one sees then is that an idea from Europe has uh, traveled uh, across the world and uh, as a consequence the sovereign state is the basic unit of the international system and also enjoys a normative equality. So within the General Assembly of the United Nations or at the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, a state the size of France would, uh, uh, would exercise the same rights as uh, a, a state the size of Sri Lanka and we do know that uh, the number of states has increased to a wide degree and now the number nearly 190. At the same time, there has also multiplied the number of international organizations which regulate these states in multiple ways and it is the interaction between these states within in a state of globalization in what we call global governance. So when one looks back on the modern state, one is struck by this impersonal artificial apparatus which is given the charge of regulating human life. So the emergence of the modern state system in the 16th, 17th, 18th century in Europe is a testimony to the belief and faith in an impersonal power regulating our lives and at the same time also makes the space for the individual within this impersonal space. And the reason why one talks about impersonal space is because this is a time when uh, monarchy, mo monarchism is the order of the day and it is not till the 1776 American Revolution and the 1789 French Revolution that monarchy as a form of government is rudely and uh, brutally uh, pushed aside in favour of uh, a government formed by the people. So what, what one sees during this period is the idea that people are appropriating the sovereignty once in the hands of their monarch in themselves and then these ideas are celebrated as self-evident truths uh, that is the equality between amongst men and over here it is specifically amongst white men because uh, during this period, uh, slavery, uh, the slavery trade 
uh, the trade in slaves hasn't been abolished yet that comes uh, in the early 19th century 1823 if I'm not mistaken and this is a period when uh, men are celebrating uh, the, the rights of man as Paine puts it and this is a period of the heyday of republicanism and uh, civic liberties and the political rights of individuals. Now why this is important is because uh, this uh, occurrence uh, which took place about 200 years ago was a form of empowerment of uh, the individual, uh, the faith in the constitution, uh, the civil rights movement in America, uh, the civil war in America, uh, the French uh, revolution, uh, the coming of Napoleon, the codification of law uh, in France, all of these uh, were hugely uh, instrumental in bolstering the authority of the state in codification. This is also a time when uh, the state undertakes uh, uh, public welfare measures. So the uh, setting up of schools, uh, hospitals and jails are part of uh, the formation of the modern state and the modern state therefore is then a, uh, is then a unit within which the power of the state is impersonal uh, but it uh, regulates our lives from uh, from our birth till our death but it is also a, a sovereign state in the sense that it does not take orders from anybody else and a sovereign state by definition uh, is the, uh, the highest authority is the state itself. Now why this is important is that when we discuss globalization and when we look at international relations, we see that there is a certain erosion of this sovereignty. So looking at uh, Jean Baudin, the theorist of sovereignty who argued that sovereignty, who theorized sovereignty, where sovereignty was seen as that absolute control uh, above which uh, there was no higher power. That idea has come to be, has come to be chipped away at uh, when we speed up things and we look at the, the various changes which have taken place in the 21st century. As a consequence of globalization, we now have uh, laws and regulations over every conceivable aspect of international politics. Whether it is the law of the seas, uh, whether it is the International Criminal Tribunal, whether it is the uh, dispute settlement body of the WTO, there are uh, organizations which have shaped and chipped away at the uh, ero have chipped away at the sovereignty of these of modern states. So when we are looking at uh, the relationship between the modern state and uh, globalization and the role of uh, globalization in um, global governance, there are a few points of view which are worthy of uh, being looked into. The first is of course uh, the idea that this is the end uh, of the state. Now that is an, uh, that is an argument which has been put forward by uh, champions of uh, globalization. Uh, Kenichi Omaha is one of them who argues that uh, globalization has uh, eroded that sovereign authority over its uh, boundaries, over it, the bounded nature itself of uh, states has been questioned and those assumptions that we made about the boundedness of sovereignty has come into question. So if the first assault on globalization or the first assault on the state has been made by globalization, it is then a force which comes from the outside. It is a force which is uh, regulating um, 
uh, behavior, regulating uh, codes of conduct, regulating acquisition, trade, nuclear weapons and therefore there is a new sense of sovereignty where sovereignty is not absolute but sovereignty exists at the uh, scale of uh, cooperation, negotiation and adhering to and compliance uh, with these uh, international codes. So whether it is international law uh, or regulatory mechanisms in trade, environment uh, and other areas of humanitarian justice, human rights, uh, one sees that there is a thick uh, thick linkages between uh, states and international organizations, uh, states and non-government organizations and of course the relationship of the state with technology itself. So in the evaluation of the state today, the first uh, question mark which we can uh, assign to the state itself is its new avatar as a negotiator, uh, if not a driver, but as a participant in international politics. So that is the first uh, complication in the last 50 years and uh, we have seen as to how there has been a multiplication in the number of uh, agreements, the areas it has been championed, so whether it is peace and security, landmines. Uh, climate change, uh, clean water, um, uh, endangered animals. There is a extremely dense uh, codification of regulatory mechanisms across borders and states therefore now are compelled to comply uh, with these mechanisms. So that's the first uh, manner in which one can evaluate uh, the state and therefore scholars like Susan Strait or Susan Strange would say that the state is retreating. It is retreating from uh, the territory, it is retreating from its monopoly of violence uh, because now you have several other legitimate forms of uh, uh, um, security organizations which are equally le legitimized to uh, carry out a war uh, in a military fashion. So when we pause and reflect upon uh, the nature of the state and the state in the 21st century, it is globalization which raises questions about uh, sovereignty, about the relationship between uh, citizens and the state and about the fundamental uh, commitment of the state to public welfare. Uh, as we saw in the previous uh, lecture, under the Washington Consensus, states are pressurized to reduce uh, public expenditure on uh, public welfare projects such as schools and hospitals, which also opens the ground for private players. Uh, to enter and um, change the dynamics between the relationship between uh, the citizen and the state. The second assault on the sovereign state has come from within and over here we look at again we return to the issue of nationalism and the emergence of secessionist groups which challenge the legitimacy of the modern state over its boundary. So whether it is uh, uh, Catalonia and Spain, uh, Kashmir in India, uh, there are multiple examples, the Kurds in uh, Iraq, uh, there are multiple examples of uh, nas nations with a common uh, history, language, culture, uh, championing or uh, fighting for secessionism or at least a recognition of their rights to self-determination. In many ways this again reminds us of the bloody uh, history of the formation of 
uh, states themselves and as to how uh, the state itself is seen as a, a, a logical end to the aspirations of a nation. In the 21st century, uh, the right to self-determination is a quest for a bounded space, a territory and a state and statehood itself and several nations are in that process or in that campaign of uh, struggle to achieve that. And that also points to us the fact that the state itself is now a celebrated uh, promised land. The promised land now is uh, the achievement of, a of achieving a state and it is to that end that nations uh, without a state are uh, now, not now, have been struggling for decades to achieve that which again is a bloody a struggle, a hard struggle, a political campaign which isn't easy but nonetheless tells us that there is a universalization uh, of the idea of the state itself. So when we look at the state in today's uh, uh, times, what we see is that there are uh, forces beyond the state and forces within the state which are questioning its legitimacy and by legitimacy we mean its right to rule on what basis do states have a right to govern and that takes us back to the issue of governance itself. At a time when governance issues are being, uh, decisions are made uh, hundreds of miles away in headquarters of the IMF, of the, world, of the World Trade Organization when decisions which impact everyday lives are made not in the nation, not in the state that they belong to but by organizations beyond it. We can also therefore question the legitimacy of the state itself. If uh, decisions which impact its people are no longer its mandate, then what is the state? We then argue, one can then argue that the state has been hollowed out. The state has been hollowed out of its uh, mandate of uh, public welfare, of its commitments to its people, of uh, sovereignty in itself and what one then finds is that governance is uh, an intersection between uh, the state, uh, private players, multinational corporations, technology and all of this comes within the gambit of globalization. So international relations therefore is a rapidly transforming space. It is a space where war and peace itself are being defined, redefined constantly. Uh, the last century has been a horrific century of battles and struggles and uh, uh, resistances and protests and uh, triumphs and uh, peace. So the last century is a uh, has been a complex and rich period for international relations and therefore the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, ethnic nationalism, ethnic cleansing, uh, the, the, birth of, the birth and creation of international organizations and finally globalization itself have made the world a rich, fascinating, bewildering space where each one of us is tr constantly trying to make sense of the world that we belong in. Now in this course of international relations, what this has opened up the ground for uh, us is to take this journey forward and to look at the many debates, discussions around the environment, uh, around economic policies, uh, around the future of the state itself 
and therefore I invite you to, uh, I urge you to look at uh, IR not uh, just through a theoretical lens but as a rapidly changing space of uh, growing interlinkages between uh, spaces, between time, between geographies. Uh, we know that globalization has rapidly changed uh, the pace and means of migration. But at the same time, it is equally important to pay attention to the great inequalities in our world today. Uh, IR would be meaningless if we turn away from the gaps between rich and poor states, uh, between uh, equality and inequality within a state and the growing momentum which, pay, which tells us to pay attention to the dispossessed of children, of uh, the trafficking of women and children, of, of human rights, of uh, violations of uh, the rights of individuals across the world and human and uh, international relations therefore returns to where we started off in 1919 which is with a ethical normative quest of what is the meaning of war and suffering uh, what is the quality of life, uh, what is the comparable quality of life between a white, between a western, uh, between a first world country and a third world country. As scholars and practitioners and as students, uh, what is that lens, what is that perspective that we utilize when we look at uh, the world outside our window. Uh, are we as realists or uh, do we look at the power politics and explain it away by arguing that power is constant and interest is defined by power and that national interest would always be above everything else or do we celebrate the Bretton Woods institutions the way liberal institutionalist, liberal uh, scholars such as Keo Hain and I do. Uh, liberalism, this is truly the age of neoliberalism and we can see that in as we look at the progress made by the World Trade Organization in terms of education, in services, in migration. Or do we, uh, like the Marxists, uh, like the Frankfurt School, like Robert Cox, do we then look at the world that we inhabit and see the source, the mode of production and the nature of the relationship between the worker and the produced. The fourth perspective, perspective that we've seen is that of feminism. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the greatest, the most influential decisions uh, which regulate our lives when it comes to education, health, infrastructure are now being taken by nameless bureaucrats uh, hundreds of miles away, predominantly men. So the questions that we then need to ask are what are the global inequalities upon which IR is premised? Is there a scope for emancipation or there isn't? And in this course, we have looked at the multiple perspectives of IR and most crucially, we have looked at uh, the growth of international organizations. We have looked at the meaning of uh, globalization and eventually we have stopped at looking at the nation state itself. As we end our course, what I urge you to reflect upon is the relationship between the individual and uh, the state. Uh, as technology becomes more pervasive and incisive and influential, uh, we find that there are forces beyond uh, the, the uh, national borders that influence us and therefore as citizens. 
uh, it is it is foremost upon us as students of IR to ask the question about the relationship between the state, the power and the system and that is fundamentally those three layers upon which IR is built. So I end this course by asking a few questions about our location in uh, to knowledge, our location uh, within international relations, our location within international politics. Uh, how does one assess a state's uh, foreign policy? Uh, is it on the basis of ethics? Is it on the basis of real politics? Uh, the mandate of IR, of course, has changed dramatically from a time when it looked on the outside. Uh, Neoliberal policies have compelled us to look on the inside. What is the impact of uh, globalization on the inside? And one can summarize and say that those distinctions between outside and inside have truly collapsed uh, to a point that uh, globalization is fundamentally about individuals against global forces. And with that, we end this uh, course. I hope that uh, it has been an enjoyable journey and an insightful journey. And the, the road ahead is, of course, equally rich and inviting. There are several avenues to look up in IR, whether it is international law, uh, humanitarian law, um, international organizations such as the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, of uh, foreign policies, uh, gender issues within uh, migration uh, and of course the most crucial issues of labor and production. So with that I end this course and uh, thank you very much uh, for being here with me. Thank you.